This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the show, Leading in the 21st Century, with me, your host, Mark Nichols. Um, I have to be honest with you all, guys. It has been a hectic day today. I've literally just sat down in the chair, um, preparing myself for this evening's show. Um, I finally met Tom Rogers, the face of Teachers Talk Radio. Um, Brilliant day today. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Okay, okay, let's get this show started. As I was saying just earlier today, um, I had the privilege of attending the um, BET show 2023. Um, I met uh, Teachers Talk Radio um, co-host, uh, host, should I say, uh, Tom Rogers and Seema, who does brilliant work behind the scenes uh, in scheduling and promoting Teachers Talk Radio. Um, so it has been a bit of a rush today. Um, and with the weather outside, I don't know about you guys, but it seems like we've had probably two months worth of rain chucked down upon us um in in the space of a single day um i didn't realize just how bad it was because i have been inside all day um driving home from london today was like uh, more like sailing home should i say anyway um let us uh, move on with the show so greetings my fellow educators uh, welcome to another captivating episode of leading in the 21st century now I am your host, Mark Nichols. Um, I am an experienced educator, having taught for now almost 15 years, around about that figure. Um, You know, I'm an educational leader. I'm a full-time teacher, uh, teaching English. Um, And this uh, uh, radio show explores um, the challenges that educators face, especially educational leaders face in the 21st century. Um, I'm committed um, for you, my listeners, Uh, in exploring um, the cutting edge of technology as well within education. You know, if you've listened to previous shows, um, you would have heard discussions um, surrounding the concept of STEAM. That was our last episode uh, two weeks ago. Uh, We've explored artificial intelligence. We've explored digitalization. We've explored what the future of education may look like. But tonight, we have a truly enlightening and interactive show designed specifically for you. Now, you are my dedicated educators and you are shaping the minds of the future. So I hope that this episode is going to help guide you in this shaping of students of the 21st century. Now, join us on this remarkable journey as we delve into the intriguing world of AI policy, both here um, you know, in, in, in the UK, but also across the globe. Now, in, you know, just to give you a, a bit of background, you know, I've, I've been trialling with new segments for this show, and I'm going to stick with a segment that we created a fair few weeks ago now. Um, it is Did You Know, um, unanimously named there, um, but our Did You Know segment today is going to be focused on artificial intelligence, AI uncovered, if you will. And this is where, you know, we will unveil some lesser known facts um, and thought provoking insights, I guess, about the rapid evolution of AI, artificial intelligence, and its impact on education. Um, Quite relevant because today at BET 2023, there was lots of discussion surrounding this disruptive technology. Um, I hope that if you've tuned in, that through listening to this podcast, you will be helping to stay ahead of the curve in this ever evolving landscape. But wait, that's not all. That's just one segment. I kid you not. There is more. Um, I will also give you an exclusive behind the scenes look at the renowned Bet Show 2023. Now, this is the event that brings together 
um, thought leaders, innovators, educators, consultants, you know, the best of the best in the ed tech world um, coming together to discuss and present the future of learning. Um, in this seg uh, segment of the show, I will be sharing with you my own reflections and the key takeaways from this inspiring event. Um, <laughs> I tell you, this is fresh in my mind. I've literally pulled up um, I've picked up my kids from school today. Um, well, I should say I picked them up. We swam out of school today um, and I've come home, sat down in this chair and I'm ready to just let loose on the experience of being at BET 2023. And that's going to be, you know, the core segment of of the show, um, you know, where I provide you with, you know, my first hand account of meeting you know, many professionals there, the panels uh, panel shows, uh, panel shows and panels, well, question panels um, that, that I ob observed, um, you know, the, the interviews that I uh, conducted along with um, fellow TTR host um, Tom Tom Rogers, um, the networking that was involved there, even the coffee, uh, the coffee was top notch. I've got a, a really, really compliment New Line um, technologies, the, the, the screen um, uh, uh, developers and providers, uh, interactive screens, should I say, that had hosted TTR, like their, their coffee was second to none. Anyway, this show isn't about coffee. It's about groundbreaking ideas and technologies <laughs> that are redefining education in the 21st century. Now, that's not all. So not only am I going to allow you to delve into the unknown or the realms of AI uncovered, not only am I going to give you insight into BET 2023, I will also dive deep into the UK's latest policy on AI in education. Some of you will probably be aware that this week, um, almost by coincidence, one might say, is BET um, being launched on Wednesday. Um, you know, the DfE published its policy, finally published policy, guiding schools and the education sector on artificial intelligence. This has been a long time coming. Um, um, I haven't had a chance to fully comprehend the document itself. However, um, I will be giving you a small review of this policy at the very end of the show, dissecting some of its implications and the potential challenges that face educators in the 21st century. You know, these are, you know, this is going to be integral to your classroom practice. Now, I hope that this analysis, you know, will ignite, you know, some thought provoking conversation on how we as educators are going to navigate, you know, this this uncharted territory. As I've said in previous um, episodes of Leading in the 21st Century, you know, this is very much the Wild West of the digital age. Um, and there will be lots of to in and fro in towards this concept of artificial intelligence. It's a concept. It's not an idea anymore. It is an actual thing. Um, but it is much like the Bible. Is. So let's strap in. Let's you know join me on this extraordinary journey as we explore the frontiers of technology and education, as we break down those barriers, as we unlock the limitless potential of leading in the 21st century. Now, your participation and insights are invaluable to Teacher Talk Radio. So do not hesitate to call in. You know, if you're listening live through Podbean app, you know, call in. You know, you are there. Cheers, Tom. I can see the bet hero comment there. But call in. You know, I will be available. I'll take your questions. Um, if not, follow us on social media. Use the hashtag um, Teachers Talk Radio, um, hashtag leading in the 21st century, if you will. And let's embark on this adventure together and pave the way for a brighter and more inclusive future for all. Now, let's move on to our first segment. Did you know? Okay, so fellow educators, it's time to embark on a, an electrifying journey into our first segment of the evening. This is AI in Covered, the Did You Know segment of the show. Prepare to be amazed as we unveil some of the truly unique and intriguing facts about the world of artificial intelligence that you might not have encountered before. 
Um, we'll also dig a little bit deeper and explore the impact of these potential implications for education. So did you know, this is fact one, by the way, did you know the term artificial intelligence was first coined back in 1956 at the Dartmouth, Dartmouth Conference, an event that brought together leading computer scientists of the time to explore the potential of machines simulating human intelligence. It was first coined in 1956. Now, as educators, you know, this reminds us, I suppose, as to how far AI has come since its early beginnings. You know, we're, we're talking, we're in 2023 now. I know it's, you know, 20 odd years away, 20, 25, 27 years even until we get to 2050. But we're talking almost 75 years now since the, 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 the term AI was coined when we had professionals in the field of computer science debating, you know, the potentiality of machines simulating human intelligence. And we are now in the 21st century beginning to realise you know, what impact this will have on us as educators. You know, it reminds us just how far it's come since then. You know, today we are witnessing AI-driven innovations in the classroom um, and that would have been unimaginable just a few decades ago. I say unimaginable a few decades ago. I would say it was probably unimaginable maybe two, three years ago before the pandemic. You know, I spoke to many teachers um, you know, prior to ChatGPT being launched in November, you know, even just six months prior um, about the, the possibility of AI in education. And quite often it was battered away as or humoured as to be something that was far into the future. You know, this is not going to have an impact on us at least for 10, 15, 20 years. But here we are debating now, you know, here we are going to be reviewing the AI policy from the DfE which is going to have a significant impact on education. Fact two, did you know one of the earliest AI programs was called ELISA? She was developed in the 1960s by Joseph Weizenbaum at MIT. ELISA simulated a psychotherapist engaging users in text-based conversations. So the 1960s, our first AI, our first AI program had a name, Eliza, and she engaged with participants through, again, that chatbot sort of system that we see in ChatGPT or Google Bard now, should I say. Now, this early example highlights the power of AI to foster human-like interactions. In the classroom, conversational AI tools could possibly provide valuable support for students and teachers alike, helping to bridge communication gaps and, potentially, enhance those learning experiences. And, you know, if you're listening to this and you're thinking to yourself, OK, that's just a load of rubbish, it, you know, it, it is not. I've seen it with my own eyes today, you know, engaging with large uh, language model simulators that respond in real time to the work that students are completing, giving advice, you know, setting the pace for an individual student, personalised to them. And this is coming from the back of the 1960s when we have this psychotherapist AI engaging in text-based conversations. I would imagine that programme would have been incredibly simplistic, you know, perhaps you know, a limited algorithm that um, would respond in, in, in turn. But from what we're seeing today, we have quite a complex and highly engaging system, which is only going to become more complex as time goes on. So this is very much a reality for us today. You know, it was first done in the 1960s. We are now in the 2020s. Time has moved on. We are going to see that progress. Now, fact three, did you know AI is no longer limited to just one language? Today, AI language models can understand and generate text in hundreds of language languages, breaking down communication barriers 
and fostering global collaboration in the field of education. You know, I absolutely love this fact. Genuinely, it reminds me very much. I mean, I'm an English teacher, by the way, in case anyone didn't, you know, you've just tuned into the podcast or you've just tuned in live. You know, I absolutely love literature. I love reading, but I'm a huge fan of science fiction. I remember my geography um, A-level lecturer, uh, environmental science A-level lecturer as well, actually. He did both. But I remember him handing me a book in my teens saying, you need to read this. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You know, I'm talking here about the babble fish, this little fish that you would pop into your ear and it would break down any language in the universe, whether it's alien, whether it is Dutch, French, English, whatever it may be. It automatically translates and you have instant access to all languages across the globe, across the universe, should I say, in the case of um, Hitchhiker's Guide. Now, this is interesting for us as educators because we could now harness multilingual uh, lingual cap- capability to create a more inclusive learning environment. You know, I will speak about this from one of our keynote speakers from BET today who made specific reference to this as to what impact it had on her classroom. Um, But the point that I want to make with this particular fact is that it's this use of AI is only taking us one step forward into that globalized world that seems to be seems to have been creeping up on us over the past, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, however long. Um, it, it has been happening. It's just one step closer to bringing unity to the world that we live in. Um, plus, it might cause some apprehension to our MFL teachers out there, um, possibly. I mean, I love the MFL departments. I love walking in and saying, right, so we don't need you anymore. Let's just get the AI chatbots out there and um, we can do do away with those MFL teachers. Uh, usually I get pens and various bric-a-brac thrown at me if that were to ever happen. But I dearly do love my colleagues in MFL um, and I do humour them. I, I, just to put the record straight, I don't actually think that MFL teachers will be replaced. I think they do so much more than just teach a language. They are teaching students skills to think and um, operate in different ways, in different manners. It's not just about breaking down that language. It's about thinking in a different language. It's about thinking and creating different links in that brain of ours. Um, So there will always be a need, in my opinion, for MFL teachers. Now, fact four, did you know AI-powered adaptive learning systems have revolutionized the way we teach and learn? That's not really much of a fact, is it? I think most of us should uh, will be aware of that. I mean, these systems can analyze students' performance in real time. Sorry, that's my dog growling at my rabbits. Apologies. Um, these systems can analyze students' performance in real time, providing personalized feedback and adjusting the learning path to suit each individual's unique needs. I've spoken about this at length in previous shows, and I will be speaking about it later in this show as well as we. Um, review some of the panels um, that I had experienced today. Now, this personalization can obviously make a significant difference in the classroom. Um, it's one of the trends of future thinking schools is to personalize education. And this is a big step for, you know, ed tech companies and for, ed, you know, future educators to tailor their approach to each student, ensuring that no learner is going to get left behind. You know, I could sum it up for you in the words um, in some words that, you know, if you think about your traditional disadvantaged students now, as opposed to your advantaged students, let's say your PP versus your non-PP. Now, your non-PPs, if they're struggling with a piece of work at home, they might approach their parents. They would ask their parents for support and guidance. Their parents would give that support and guidance. Now, your PP students or your disadvantaged students, same piece of work. They don't understand it. What they might not have access to is parents that would support them with that piece of work. Personalized AI might be able to step in and plug that gap, you know, to give fair and equal access. You know, it's not going to be exclusive for one set of student or one type of student. It's going to be accessible to all, allowing education to be personalized across the spectrum um, and hopefully break down that barrier between the disadvantaged and the non-disadvantaged once and for all. Fact five, did you know 
artificial intelligence is playing a critical role in addressing some of the world's most pressing environmental challenges. From predicting natural disasters to optimizing renewable energy sources, AI-powered solutions are driving sustainable development for a greener future. By incorporating AI-driven sustainability initiatives into our own curricula, whether that be in actual curriculum time devoted, you know, uh, within science lessons, let's say, or geography or English or history, whatever it may be, or if it's some form of co-curricular or super curriculum, whatever it may be, if we are incorporating these AI driven sustainability initiatives into our curricula, we can inspire the next generation of environmental stewards, equipping them with the knowledge and skills to tackle the global challenges for tomorrow you know this very much is future thinking you know there is huge pressure on our environment today and there is this kind of call to arms in the education sector concerning like the um, assimilation of um, and adoption of students and, and growing the next generation of environmentalists and AI is going to play a critical role in that. Fact six, I promise you there's just one more fact to go and then we'll be through um, with this segment. Now fact six, did you know that AI has even ventured into the realm of art? Neural, ne- by the way, I absolutely love pieces of art. Um, you know, I was doing some research because at the moment, I really, really like the idea of creating like an art gallery within the English corridor, the English wing of my new school. Um, And I really, really want to kind of have that cross curricular links between, you know, famous pieces of art, you know, significant pieces of art and the texts and the the, the curriculum upon which I'm planning and and delivering to uh, students at my school. Um, You know, so I just absolutely love it. And, And there's one particular unit where, you know, I want to tie in this piece of artwork, the first piece of artwork that was sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, created purely by, by AI. Um, you know, it fetched a very, very high price. I don't have the exact figure off, off the top of my head. Um, but fast forward, you know, I think it's four or five years, you can now um, have the likes of certain, um, how can I put this without dropping the names in, certain search engine um image creators that will do artwork for you in a matter of seconds um great if you are trying to design business cards or you just want to do a bit of artwork um it's up to you anyway these neural networks uh, a type of ao model ai model have been used to generate original paintings um, music compositions um it could even be used to write poetry um so ai you know clearly um is going perhaps change the face of the artistic um, culture that we have in society. Now, it is a creative application of AI, and it's going to. I I feel that this particular aspect of AI is going to challenge us to redefine what the boundaries of art and technology in education is. If that makes sense, you know, if we integ in integral. <laughs> In, in integrate AI generated art into our classrooms, we're going to encourage students to think critically about the role of that technology in the creative process. You know, when is a piece of art no longer a piece of art? You know, just because it's been created by a, 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 an algorithm and does that, that automatically rule it out as, okay, that's not a piece of art because it's not created by a human being? Um, what if they didn't know that it was a piece of art that was created by an algorithm and it still evoked an emotional response? Let's say it's a piece of music that really you know, appeals to that individual. Um, I don't think it will be long, actually, before musicians and artists start to utilise AI to generate higher forms of art that really do inspire um, new audiences, you know, it might even inspire new forms of artistic expression. We might even see a new artistic movement come into fruition because of artificial intelligence. You know, we don't know what those boundaries are. So I feel that particular fact that AI has crept 
say crept, it's not really crept, has smashed into the artistic realm um, is quite an important fact to consider, especially for any art teachers out there. Now, my final fact within this segment of the show is, did you know AI is transforming healthcare and medical research by aiding in the development of new drugs, uh, predicting disease outbreaks, as well as improving diagnostics? As educators, we can utilise AI advancements in healthcare to enrich our science and health curricula. Now, this will inspire students to pursue careers in these fields, potentially contributing to life-saving breakthroughs. You know, you know, I I can't stress the importance of this. You know, I suppose this is a much wider point regarding artificial intelligence, and that is, you know, the careers and the disruption that AI is going to cause, you know, future careers is something that's really important. And if any of your students are out there looking to pursue careers in the sciences, in medicine, then you you have to, you know, it's your moral responsibility as an educator to discuss with them the concept of AI, the technology itself, and begin at least future-proofing, future-thinking what the advancements in healthcare will be because they are going to come about rapidly, okay? Now, that wraps up our did you know ai uncovered segment um i do appreciate you listening through that with me um i absolutely love this this segment because i learn as much um from this experience as i'm sure you guys do um i hope the fascinating facts have engaged you and they've ignited your curiosity and they've given you some food support um the potential that ai holds now Stay tuned. Um, we are going to break the news. Um, and then after, we are going to dive into the next segment where I teach you into the exclusive behind the scenes tour of the Tech Pro 2023. So stay tuned. Enjoy the news. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides, and magazines specifically aimed at forward thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. This is Teachers Talk Radio. And this is Teachers Talk Radio News. In a week where Ofsted has found itself under increased pressure and scrutiny following the death of a primary school head teacher, The Independent has focused on the decision by many school leaders to remove references to Ofsted from websites. The removal of logos and other references from school letterheads, websites and other materials is being done in what many describe as solidarity with head teacher Ruth Perry. Other forms of protest against the inspectorate have included the wearing of black clothing and displaying photographs of Miss Perry in schools where inspections are taking place. Unions have also urged Ofsted to pause inspections and the NEU handed in a petition to the Department for Education, which had 45,000 signatures, calling for an accountability system that was supportive, effective and fair. In a statement, Amanda Spielman, HMCI, said it would be against children's best interests to pause inspection and that inspection was important for both schools and parents. It has been further revealed by the BBC that inspectors had visited Cavisham Primary School, where Miss Perry was head teacher, in 2019, as part of a pilot of the latest inspection framework, and that Miss Spielman had also been present. In a newsletter written at the time, Miss Perry said she was proud of how well pupils and staff had responded to the experience, and that feedback had been overwhelmingly positive. But a formal inspection in November 2022 rated Cavisham Primary as inadequate as a result of failings in training, record keeping and checks on staff. Although it did also state that children were provided with a good education and that the school was a welcoming and vibrant community. In a statement, Amanda Spielman said that the the debate about reforming inspections to remove grades was legitimate, but any changes would need to meet the needs of parents and government. And a spokesman for the Prime Minister said, we are confident the current rating system provides the right level of transparency for parents. 
In Manchester, students at the city's university who have been refusing to pay their rent in protest at high costs have been removed from a university building by bailiffs. The group of rent strikers had occupied the University of Manchester's Simon Building and videos on the BBC News website appeared to show some protesters being carried out. A spokesperson for the university said it regretted the action but that the protest had been going on for a significant amount of time. Campaigners said the situation was disgraceful and shamed the university. Around 250 students cancelled payments in January and demanded a 30% reduction in rent, arguing they were struggling to buy food amid the cost of living crisis. A smaller group occupied the building and it was this group who were removed by bailiffs enforcing a court order after they had ignored multiple requests to leave. At the University of Birmingham, a recovery flat where students with different addictions can live together to help them complete their studies has been opened. The BBC reports on the programme, which is being pioneered by the university and is trying to help students stay addiction free. The Vale, a huge student village near the campus in Edgbaston, is home to thousands of undergraduates. In one of the large blocks of flats, six units have now been set aside for students in recovery. Supported by a peer manager, the flats are alcohol and drug free and currently are male only, although it is hoped another flat for six female students will open next year. The hope is that students can enjoy university life without missing out on support. The programme is supporting the Better Than Well project, which currently supports around 50 students and was set up to help students with addictions to be successful at university and with their recovery. On South Townside, a primary school in Jarrow kick-started their Kindness Matters Week as it became the first Kindness Matters school in the area. Pupils at St Joseph's Catholic Primary School and its staff were asked, what does kindness mean to you? And, in the run-up to the main event, completed a 30-day Kindness Matters challenge. Kindness Matters was set up in 2012 by John McGee, known as the Kindness Coach, and it teaches kindness and well-being to school children and teachers. McGee visited the school as part of the week, where he led a super learning day focusing on what the pupils had done so far and what they would do next to help the world be more kind. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week I've got to episode 60. What better to celebrate 60 episodes but look at what potentially happens every 60 seconds online and do it in 60 seconds. To do this, I've used the term infographic in my search. Infographics are a great way to show visually a lot of data. They're not just for IT concepts and I'd recommend seeing if you can find any that represent your subject. The most recent infographic I found was in a blog by Stephanie. Heitman called What Happens in an Internet Minute. Feel free to look her up and read her research. Right, here we go. Start the countdown. In an Internet Minute, 174,000 apps are downloaded, 16.2 million texts are sent, 231 million emails are sent, 694 million songs are streamed, 6 million people buy something online, 5.9 million Google searches are made, 44 million people view Facebook live streams, 20.8 thousand active users are on LinkedIn, 2.1 2.1 million people are active on Facebook, 575,000 tweets are sent, 46,000 searches are done on Pinterest, 66,000 photos and videos are shared on Instagram, 2 million Snapchats are sent, 167 million videos are watched on TikTok, 452,000 hours of content are streamed on Netflix, 3.67 million YouTube videos are watched, and that's just the headlines of an internet minute. That's a lot of data flying around. On the biggest network of networks there is the internet. As always, if you have a question on tech, why not send it to at TT Radio Official. I'm Steve Woods and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Okay, okay. Now, welcome back to the show, Leading in the 21st Century, where I, your host, Mark Nichols, will take you on a journey into the 21st century as we explore the latest technology and insights into the world that we call education. Now, in this next stage of the show, um, this is quite experimental, really. Um, There was a part of me that was hoping to gain some new 
um, networking opportunities and to convince, um, uh, you know, professionals to call in this afternoon and, you know, feed into this, uh, feed into this segment. Um, unfortunately, I did not succeed in my quest to gain those um, networking opportunities, although I did network a great deal at the show. So instead, um, I'm going to kind of relive the experience for you, um, my dear listeners, um, and also just give you a bit of history as to what the bet show is, because I'm conscious that some of you um, who are listening to the to, to this live or to the podcast itself, you may not know what bet show 2023 actually is you may have some inclination um so we're going to unpack it you know i'm going to explore for you you know my kind of overview of the show itself a little bit of history on the show as well just to give you that context um some of the panels that i attended some of the keynote speakers some of the networking opportunities um and some of the key takeaways either from the innovation that i had witnessed at the show or the ideas that we discussed. Um, and I also will be making reference to Bobby, the um, barista who plied me with coffee throughout the day. Um, it was a pleasure to, to, to have met him as well. So let us get started. Now, I just want to kind of explore with you the history of BET. Now, the BET show, um, which is an acronym for the British Educational Training and technology began as a uh, began as a um, kind of like a visionary endeavor um, in the 1980s. I believe it was actually in 1985, a year before I was born. So the show itself is just as old as as, as I am. And the purpose of the show was to bridge the gap between education and technology. Um, and since its inception. BET has grown exponentially. It's established itself as a premier event for educators, technology providers and innovators, not just within Britain itself, because obviously it is a British um, brand, as it were, but across the globe. You know, we're talking a global reach where, you know, people from across the world come to BET, um, you know, in London Bet London 2023 to kind of ply their wares to discuss the future of education and to showcase the most cutting edge um, in, in, in technology. Now, this annual show has been instrumental in driving educational standards, uh, educational transformation. Um, it's impacted the lives of countless students and teachers. For me personally, the first time I had even heard of the show was probably about five years ago when one of the craziest head um, assistant head teachers or deputy head teachers that I'd worked for, I say crazy, he genuinely, you know, if he's listening to the show, my apologies, um, Mr. Edwards, um, but he he was, you know, up there, you know, he was an architect in a, in a previous career, designer, um, and he had some great ideas, crazy ideas, um, but he introduced me to the concept of bet and showed me what it could do. And he brought back with him like game changing technology into the school where I work. So from that point forward, I was like, actually, this sounds like a pretty decent um, venue to, to learn about this cutting edgeness of the educational world. Now, the inception of the Bet Show in 1985 actually coincided with the rapid growth of personal computing. You know, we're talking about the 1980s here the emergence and mass marketing of computer technology. Um, and obviously, that was personal computing, but also computing in the classroom. Now, at around about that time, technology was quickly becoming an essential tool for teaching and learning. And BET recognised the need for a dedicated platform to showcase the latest innovations in ed tech. Now, over the years, the show has evolved to meet the ever-changing landscape of education, um, education technology, should I say, um, from the early days of desktop computers and CD-ROMs to the rise of the internet, mobile devo devices, and more recently, as we've discussed, um, as I heard continually discussed today, artificial intelligence. BET has been drive a driving force behind the adoption of this cutting-edge tools and solutions in the classroom. 
I'm going to share with you very quickly some milestones in the history of, of the bet show. And that includes in the 1990s when bet started to gain momentum as the internet as an international event. And this is when it attracted exhibitors and visitors from around the world. Um, and during this time, the internet began to reshape education. Remember the 1990s where you had dial up internet, for example. Um, BET played a crucial role in introducing educators to the World Wide Web and its potential for revolutionising teaching and learning. So if you're sat there and you're listening to me speak right now and you're thinking, OK, you know, could you plan a lesson without using the Internet today? Do you incorporate the Internet into your classroom practice? If you do, then you've got to thank the innovators that attended the show, you know, in the 1990s because they were the ones driving the World Wide Web. They were the ones speaking about this. You know, in the early 90s, we're talking here, they were the ones talking about this great internet that would connect computers and devices together to the point where, fast forward into the modern age, into, you know, a contemporary age, where we may take it for granted. So it's kind of like this kind of breeding ground for innovation so you might look at better and think, oh, yeah, it's too far out there. But actually, it's the starting point that drives the cutting edge. Now, in the 2000s, BET continued to expand. It showcased a range of emerging technologies, such as interactive whiteboards, mobile devices, learning management systems. And I can tell you now, <laughs> they plug a lot of money into the management and uh, the, the systems and operations for education. Anyone that works you know, on a senior leadership team in terms of um, the management of schools. There's a lot to be had and, and explored at the, at the show. Now, the event became a forum for educators to explore new ways of integrating this technology into classrooms as well as schools across the board. Now, in the 2010s, um, you know, <laughs> now we're getting to the age when I start teaching here. Um, the BET show entered, yeah, was it 2008? I think I started teaching. It was around about the year when Barack Obama, just before he was um, became the, the, the US president uh, for his first inning. So around about 2007, 2008, I think. Is that right? Um, ignore me, ignore me. Uh, no, don't ignore me because this is a radio show. You need to listen to this stuff. But ignore the previous comment. But in the 2010s, um, Bet, you know, focused on the role of technology in supporting personalised learning. So this is where we first start to get that concept as to how digital... Um, the digital platform can help personalise learning uh, as well as develop d digital citizenship, global collaboration, as it were. Um, this is where we see the rise of mobile learning, cloud computing and increasing importance of data analytics in education. You know, if you're familiar with cloud platforms where you save all of your resources, I'm talking X drives, WinPool, you know, the places where all of the school's documents are saved on the cloud. It started um, at BET. You know, that's where it began. The movements began. I think SharePoint, for example, uh, the early days in the, in the 2010s, if anyone can remember. Now, in the 2020s, that's where we are currently. Um, we're moving into the current decade. Now, the show continues to adapt and evolve, addressing the challenges and opportunities presented by artificial intelligence, virtual and augmented reality, as well as the growing emphasis on digital well-being and online safety. Now, throughout its history, the Bet Show has been a catalyst for change, as I've already discussed, and it's inspired generations of educators, including myself, and innovators to embrace the transformation of the transformative um, power of technology. The event today attracts over you know forty thousand attendees, probably more, to be perfectly honest. You know, it spans across three days. Um, you know, we have, you know, many people from across the globe. I think it's somewhere akin to 150, possibly more different countries that come and explore. For example, you know, I was wandering through a, sec uh, a section of the Excel Centre today and there's like a whole global showcase with each um, country, each nationality having their own kind of embassy, as it were, bringing technology that they are utilising in their education systems to share and explore across um, across the globe. Um, you know, it is a dynamic platform for networking, for learning and collaboration. You know, 
you see educators, you could spot a teacher a mile off, I would say. You could see the teachers, not only because they have a big badge that says teacher on the front, um, but generally just the way they're walking around and looking at the, these things. You then know who the consultants are and the business managers, the ones that are selling the wares. They're the ones that are suited and booted and, you know, they are applying their wares to you. Then you have, and this is my favourite, okay, this is my 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 take on this. You then have the technicians, the IT guys. You can see them wandering through. Usually, and I, you know, I'm going to use a simile here. They're like packs of kind of hobgoblins to some extent. I'm so sorry, that's quite offensive. Not hobgoblins, packs of wolves, let's say, but they are usually together in bands and they're wandering the halls and they know their stuff. They're not going to be ripped off. I overheard one person come into the stand where I was working today at New Line and it's like, yep, I'm not going to be ripped off or pay extortionate prices for screens. So tell us what you've got on offer. And it's just that kind of gusto that the tech, the, the techies have. They've gone there to solicit and, and find the technology for these settings upon which they're working. And I just, you know, I find it hilarious. I find it absolutely brilliant that they, they're there. Catherine, I can see you've tuned in to the show here. Um, you used to come to bet with Global Leap and Polycom before you became a teacher. So you were familiar with bet even before becoming a teacher yourself. So I would imagine you would have taken that into the profession with yourself when you started teaching. Um, you absolutely loved it. I can't blame you for that because it is, an, you know, it's an exhilarating experience. Um, more difficult to get out of school for the day to attend these days. It's been je jealous of all the picks this week. You know that 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 is that is the thing. You know, I, I'm I am really really lucky, and I will put a shout out for my current head teacher at the moment because, you know, uh, Reese. You know, as soon as I asked and said, look, I really would like to attend this show. I've got an opportunity to come along to it. You know, he didn't hesitate. He's like, nope, that's fine. Go along, learn. You know, grow as a profession you know, bring some information back to the school that we could benefit from. And, you know, I, I, and my colleagues as well that, you know, covered my classes for me. Um, you know, they're fan, fa absolutely fantastic. And Catherine, if you ever do get the chance, um, you know, you know, try, try to get in there again. It'd be great to know, Catherine, as to, you know, what your role is um, within your current school now. Um, you know, in terms of you know what you're doing it says uh, you focused on digital learning and you know, are you writing a digital policy for example are you um are you bringing that to the attention you say re teacher i think your role catherine i love the fact this is the you know catherine you are one of the first people that have engaged with me via the chat here other than um anyone else from TTR. So I really do appreciate this. Oh no, my first show, I had quite a few people actually, but not to this level. Um, I think you've got a really important role in education, Catherine. As an RE teacher, um, I would imagine you touch upon philosophy and ethics as well. In the 21st century, you know, I feel, and I think there are many other professionals that think <laughs> so geeky, uh, there are many um, practitioners that believe that actually every school should have like a resident philosopher, um, you know, that is going to be discussing like the ethics that sit behind the leadership and management of um, these digital systems that are inside of schools, especially with the rise of artificial intelligence and some of the, um, some of the, the, the decisions that have to be made by educational leaders. So, you know, if ever you get the chance to share your voice about the ethical concerns, I would definitely recommend that you do so. And you may be interested, Catherine, if you look back through the podcasts, I do have a few um, episodes where I talk about the ethics, uh, the ethics sitting behind the digitalization of education itself. I even once interviewed Plato, so you may be interested in that. Anyway, um, I've given you the context to bet. Um, I hope that you've kind of given, you've gained some insight into um, the show uh, it, it itself um i just want to kind of uh, kind of breeze over now my reflections on the show um itself now this is the first time actually that i have attended i have followed it in the past um ever since it was introduced to me by mr edwards 
Um, but this is the first time in attendance. So it was quite an overwhelming experience for me from the offset. Um, you know, as soon as I got there, um, I beelined straight to the arena, whereupon I sat in the first seminar of the day, which was free trends driving the future of education. I'll talk about that in more detail as we go through these reflections. Um, but that really did set the bar. Beautiful stage, well lit. It was innovative. It looked cutting edge. Um, the speakers were professional and they did touch upon, you know, the, 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 the future trends of, of ed education it, it itself. Um, it was an unforgettable experience. Um, it brought together the show itself. I felt brought together the brightest minds in education um, as well as technology, um, obviously I've mentioned it bring brought it from across the globe. It offered you know unique opportunities to collaborate. Uh, you know I noticed that there were um, collabor uh, collaborative spaces where professionals could sit down, schedule meetings via social media, and discuss at length, as opposed to just wandering aimlessly looking um, for whatnot. You know, everywhere I seemed to look, there were people sat together that you wouldn't necessarily see sat together. You know, people dressed in suits, people wearing some really outlandish costumes. You know, I even saw a unicorn dance into YMCA at one point. Uh, it was like a flash dance, I believe. Um, but it was, you know, a, a, a quite an eye opening event in itself. Um, you know, I was truly amazed you know, by the diversity of stalls and ideas, as well as the passion for shaping the future of education. Lots of people were there talking about the future and what, you know, their kind of perception as to what that future looked like and how we as educators could support. Um, I think, I think what we'll do, I will share with you some of the keynote speakers that I listened to today, so that kind of you get uh, some insight as to kind of who who I listen to. So uh, certain seminars I went to. So the first one, you know, I mentioned earlier, um, speakers that I listened to were John Solomon, who is like the VP for Google uh, Chrome operation system um, and Google Classroom uh, education, uh, Google. I don't know if I've used the, the term Google there, uh, but he had some very interesting insights that I'll share with you a, a, a bit further on in this reflection, as well as listening to um, an art teacher, um, Andrea uh, Zafaruku, um, and you know she shared her experiences of using and utilizing AI and technology in the art classroom. Um, now, specifically, these guys spoke at length about the role that Google has played in shaping education. And I know when I sat there in this audience, I felt right, okay, this is clearly you know, a huge plug at selling um, a particular platform. I mean, there are other platforms out there um, that you could kind of hook into, but this did feel like a bit of a plug and a bit of a selling of um, the, the, this one platform. But it did highlight specific trends that I have discussed in previous shows that I have explored in my own research, as well as the research of others. Uh, UCL, University College London, for example, recently did a think piece on the future school to which I've written extensively about and even broadcast a show on the future school, much akin to the trends that are demonstra were demonstrated in this, in, in this first speech that I attended. Um, I listened to keynote speakers from Microsoft. I didn't get their names, but I did sit in the audience and just listen to what um, they spoke about Again, you know, speaking about the challenges that face educators today, you know, the pandemic causing sharp declines in reading fluency and math, um, emotional well-being, um, you know, uh, looking to prioritise uh, future ready skills and soft skills. And actually, you know, that's one thing that I, I felt throughout this, no matter where I went, no matter who I was listening to or talking to, there was this discussion on a set of soft skills. It was always soft skills that was mentioned. Um, I don't like the term soft skills because it gives it kind of like this Im impression that they're skills that aren't necessarily at the centre of education, um, but they're on the they're kind of on the fence on the perimeter. And these soft skills are the 
21st century skills in communication, in igniting curiosity, in collaboration, in critical thinking, you know, these softer skills, as they were kind of discussed, and then this kind of opposition toward knowledge and the knowledge rich curriculums that the UK has. And there just seemed to be a huge disconnect between the two. And that, to me, really did stand out in the day. You know, that's that's just, that's my personal reflection. I don't know if that is the same for others that attended, but I really, you know, that really did kind of resonate with me. I listened to a few speakers and actually they all kind of shared that sentiment that if students, if the newer generations are going to succeed in this century, there has to be development and adoption and assimilation of these softer skills. But these softer skills sometimes go against perhaps what the national curriculum or what the DfE or what even Ofsted are looking for in terms of robust systems within schools. I'm not saying that there isn't a place for knowledge rich curriculums, but I'm saying perhaps there should be some recognition that these softer skills are going to play an integral part to the systems that we deliver in the future. Um, Some other keynote speakers that I listened to intently um were let me just get make sure i get their names correct uh matt wingfield who was the chief executive of the e assessment association he had a lot to say about um the future of assessment um with his panel and i'll discuss the panel show uh, the panel question show uh, later john cleman and john winkley uh, respectively um leaders within their own sectors of assessment online learnosity and alpha plus Alpha Plus being an arm of AQA, I was very interested in what this this guy had to say, and I'll, I'll put the questions to you later. We've had Jessica Blakely um, and Isabel um, Gon- Gonthia, um, both of which are leaders, uh, VPs within their own fields, um, innovating, uh, again, assessment online, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, they're, they're just some of the keynote speakers that I've kind of reviewed and, and explored f- through the day. Um there were, you know, groundbreaking technologies um, as well that I thought really did stand out to me. And I'm going to go back to that kind of the very first um, session that I sat through. And something that really did catch my attention was this um, concept of how educators may approach students that, uh, that are working at different skill levels. Again, we're going back to that first trend of personalising the learning. By the way, the three trends that were challenging education, you know, uh, future education, personalised learning, elevating teachers and establishing a growth mindset, all stuff that I hope that you are familiar with. So no, nothing new for me there, but that could be new to you in terms of the trends of future education. Um, now, uh, Google... You know, this online platform, should I say, um, announced uh, an up and coming feature um, within its uh, cloud platform classroom that aims to address the very issue of personalized learning. And this is going to be called practiced, uh, practice sets. Um, now, we saw a video, we heard them speak about this at length and the research that's gone into it. I didn't see it in person, but they did speak about it on the stage and they did share it with us. So this is something very much that is cutting edge and is being developed as we speak. Um, They described it as a game changing tool that is going to give teachers the time and resource to better support students um, and create more interactive lessons um, that will personalize feedback for students in live time. Um, I am gonna pause there for dramatic emphasis. We're talking live time, feedback in live time. Every single student in your classroom. Imagine you've got a class of 30. You set them a task. They get to work, type it away, let's say. They're working through the content. And as they are doing so, what Google has proposed is that The feedback is going to come live. It's powered through artificial intelligence, machine learning. But the feedback is going to come at those students personally 
in that moment. Now, it could be that I, for example, type in a way, you know, I know what I'm doing. I'm making good progress. You know, I'm ticking all of the boxes for my assessment criteria. And the feedback that the AI gives me as a student is keep it going. You're doing great. So really positive feedback, you know, and then I might get to a challenge toward the end. So it's kind of like a teaching assistant that the student has that is going to be pushing them on. Then there might be my younger sister next to me. Now she's working away. She struggles. She's not the sharpest tool in the shed. Um, she'll kill me for saying that. So please don't repeat it if you know who she is. She doesn't listen to this show. Um, it's too highbrow for her. Um, but um, she's working away and she gets stuck. She starts to slow down. She she can't figure out you know, what the next step is or how she's improving. And she gets lost in the work. The AI is going to feed back to her hints, tips, suggestions, prompts, whatever it may be, to guide her in her work. Now, I felt for me, this was the most innovative technology that I saw today. I didn't see it like physically there being used, but the presentation, it was delivered to us, you know, it's coming. So there's the promise of it coming. Obviously, there probably are limitations there. Um, but just the thought of that excited me. Um, and I would like very much to play around with that in the future if it is going to benefit every student in my class and also support me, you know, in giving that timely feedback. It will probably outstrip and outsource me as a practitioner because it's going to have more knowledge than I do. But my role, and I think this is linking in with the second trend, is that I will no longer become that knowledge rich professional expert in the field of English studies instead my role will morph into somewhat of a coach or a mentor guiding my students to use the the software to 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 engage with the activity and I think that is an idea a concept that really did appeal to me within the show itself the educators the role of educators is going to change in the 21st century you know we've all seen it you know there are highly specialized teachers out there that have a wealth of knowledge and they are superb in their understanding of their subjects and understanding of their fields they are experts but how long until an AI software outstrips or outsources those experts. There are limitations now, but if we fast forward in 10, 20, 30, 40 years, there is a very real possibility that they will be outsourced. So the role of the educator is potentially going to change. Um, I'm just thinking here in terms of time, we may not get on, to the last segment of this show you know I'm giving you more than I should have done I suppose in terms of um, my reflection of the day but actually I'm enjoying this um, I, I suppose that's quite selfish really isn't it you know I'm enjoying speaking my reflecting but actually you know this is you know these these are thoughts that I need to digest you know I'm learning as I'm speaking to you my dear listeners you know, I'm reflecting on the experience myself. These are thoughts, by the way, that I'm sounding out to you. They're not rehearsed. They're not scripted. They're not. Um, they're not practiced. It's not. This, this isn't like a falsification of my reflections. These are genuine reflections. As I'm sounding out to you, this is my brain, kind of reflecting on the the chaos of today. Because as I said to you at the start of the show, I am literally plopped down into my desk I can tell you when I came in through my front door soaking wet upstairs you know I'm still wearing my teachers talk uh radio t-shirt thank you by the way Tom I absolutely love it it's brilliant I'm going to cherish this 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 shirt um throughout the Easter holidays just to kind of show off that I'm a part of the team um but I come back downstairs I, I can see my rabbits are loose they've eaten the wire to my headphones so I've had to steal my daughter's headphones I've had to kind of cobble together you know, you know, my ideas, my notes from the day. And I'm feeding back to you live. You know, whether this is good listening, whether this is good radio, you know, that that's probably 
you know, up for debate. But for me, I'm sharing with you live the reflections of the day. Now, I will stop for the news now so that I can gather my thoughts and then move this reflection forward. And then I think we will explore um, the policy in AI possibly in a future episode. So I will stop for the news. Um, please do join us again um, whilst we finish the show. Um, yeah, and I look forward to, to, to continuing on our reflections. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. In a week where Ofsted has found itself under increased pressure and scrutiny following the death of a primary school head teacher, The Independent has focused on the decision by many school leaders to remove references to Ofsted from websites. The removal of logos and other references from school letterheads, websites and other materials is being done in what many describe as solidarity with head teacher Ruth Perry. Other forms of protest against the inspectorate have included the wearing of black clothing and displaying photographs of Miss Perry in schools where inspections are taking place. Unions have also urged Ofsted to pause inspections and the NEU handed in a petition to the Department for Education which had 45,000 signatures calling for an accountability system that was supportive, effective and fair. In a statement, Amanda Spielman, HMCI, said it would be against children's best interests to pause inspection and that inspection was important for both schools and parents. It has been further revealed by the BBC that inspectors had visited Caversham Primary School, where Ms Perry was head teacher, in 2019 as part of a pilot of the latest inspection framework and that Ms Spielman had also been present. In a newsletter written at the time, Ms Perry said she was proud of how well pupils and staff had responded to the experience and that feedback had been overwhelmingly positive. But a formal inspection in November 2022 rated Caversham Primary as inadequate as a result of failings in training, record keeping and checks on staff. Although it did also state that children were provided with a good education and that the school was a welcoming and vibrant community. In a statement, Amanda Spielman said that the the debate about reforming inspections to remove grades was legitimate, but any changes would need to meet the needs of parents and government. And a spokesman for the Prime Minister said, we are confident the current rating system provides the right level of transparency for parents. In Manchester, students at the city's university who have been refusing to pay their rent in protest at high costs have been removed from a university building by bailiffs. The group of rent strikers had occupied the University of Manchester's Simon Building and videos on the BBC News website appeared to show some protesters being carried out. A spokesperson for the university said it regretted the action but that the protest had been going on for a significant amount of time. Campaigners said the situation was disgraceful and shamed the university. Around 250 students cancelled payments in January and demanded a 30% reduction in rent arguing they were struggling to buy food amid the cost of living crisis. A smaller group occupied the building and it was this group who were removed by bailiffs enforcing a court order after they had ignored multiple requests to leave. At the University of Birmingham, a recovery flat where students with different addictions can live together to help them complete their studies has been opened. The BBC reports on the programme which is being pioneered by the university and is trying to help students stay addiction free. The Vale, a huge student village near the campus in Edgbaston, is home to thousands of undergraduates. In one of the large blocks of flats, six units have now been set aside for students in recovery. Supported by a peer manager, the flats are alcohol and drug free and currently are male only, although it is hoped another flat for six female students will open next year. The hope is that students can enjoy university life without missing out on support. The programme is supporting the Better Than Well project, which currently supports around 50 students, 
and was set up to help students with addictions to be successful at university and with their recovery. On South Townside, a primary school in Jarrow kick-started their Kindness Matters Week as it became the first Kindness Matters school in the area. Pupils at St Joseph's Catholic Primary School and its staff were asked, what does kindness mean to you? And in the run-up to the main event, completed a 30-day Kindness Matters Challenge. Kindness Matters was set up in 2012 by John McGee, known as the Kindness Coach, and it teaches kindness and well-being to school children and teachers. McGee visited the school as part of the week, where he led a super learning day focusing on what the pupils had done so far and what they would do next to help the world be more kind. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week I've got to episode 60. What better to celebrate 60 episodes but look at what potentially happens every 60 seconds online and do it in 60 seconds. To do this, I've used the term infographic in my search. Infographics are a great way to show visually a lot of data. They're not just for IT concepts and I'd recommend seeing if you can find any that represent your subject. The most recent infographic I found was in a blog by Stephanie. Stephanie Heitman called What Happens in an Internet Minute. Feel free to look her up and read her research. Right, here we go. Start the countdown. In an Internet Minute, 174,000 apps are downloaded, 16.2 million texts are sent, 231 million emails are sent, 694 million songs are streamed, 6 million people buy something online, 5.9 million Google searches are made, 44 million people view Facebook live streams, 20.8 thousand active users are on LinkedIn, 2.1 2.1 million people are active on Facebook, 575,000 tweets are sent, 46,000 searches are done on Pinterest, 66,000 photos and videos are shared on Instagram, 2 million Snapchats are sent, 167 million videos are watched on TikTok, 452,000 hours of content are streamed on Netflix, 3.67 million YouTube videos are watched, and that's just the headlines of an internet minute. That's a lot of data flying around. On the biggest network of networks there is the internet as always if you have a question on tech why not send it to at tt radio official i'm steve woods and that was two minute tech two minute tech with steve woods your tech briefing on teachers talk radio okay okay now welcome back to the last segment of the show um we just finished off there um where you whether it's a privilege or not um I don't know, but you got to listen to the insides of my head as I was reflecting on my day at um, the Bet Show 2023. Um, oh, really, all I was doing, though, was talking about kind of like the the impact that some of the keynote speakers had on me as a professional, um, as an educator. But you know, I didn't even delve into some of the other areas. And I do want to spend like the last, you know, 15 minutes of the show, just unpacking those for you. Um, I would also like to speak about the new AI policy, but I think I'm going to have to tie that into a future show or suggest uh, somebody else kind of um, within Teachers Talk Radio to kind of explore that and, and uh, you know, talk about that perhaps at length with uh, um, a potential guest. But anyway, um, I do want to share with you um, the other keynote speakers I spoke to was assessment um, taking place on online. And I did mention that Matt Wingfield, as well as the other leaders in that, uh, uh, in that um, area, did speak at length about the role of assessment online. And, you know, throughout this, the, the uh, throughout the panel, they were talking and discussing about the role of their companies which is all fascinating. But again, you know, and this is probably a part of my review, this is probably my only critique of the show itself is that there is a lot of noise and chatter in selling products. You know, buy me, buy me, buy me. There is a lot of that noise and chatter there. And, you know, sometimes that could be quite deafening in terms of, you know, being a practitioner, going there to kind of listen to the innovation, to listen to the forward thinking practitioners, etc. You know, if you can kind of tune out the noise and the chatter, you can pick up snippets of that innovation. And that's that's something that, you know, you have to have that kind of well-trained ear, I suppose, to be able to do. Um, now, these, these, these keynote speakers, they had a lot of important stuff to say about their companies and the role 
that they play in online assessment. And one particular speaker um, who was the representative, he was a VP for AQA, um, Alpha Plus, uh, an arm of AQA that does lots of online assessments. Um, And it came to a question which I put toward um, the panel concerning um, the role of artificial intelligence, you know, in assessment and the future of assessment and you know he was quite you know forward in stating that actually it does cause him a lot of concern and worry about the rigor and the credibility of work that's produced online Um, but what he did say as well is that the use of um, artificial intelligence to generate questions and to generate um exam papers actually um, can be quite beneficial but not only that he did also speak about breaking down the barriers between those the haves and the have-nots in having access to fair and equal um, education Um, and and go back to that point I made earlier in the show about you know a student not necessarily having um, a decent base or a, uh, a set of uh, parents that are willing to support etc um, using AI might be that solution to support those students that might not have that back in in the home to help them have access to their learning um, but he also spoke you know I got these kind of the inclination of this kind of globalization of assessment and how you know, in, in the West, typically, and in the wealthier nations, we have a platform of assessment that gives credentials to the individual that can go on then to um, participate in, you know, a more high function in societies. Um, and through artificial intelligence, these assessments could, in theory, be globalised so that everybody um, can have equal access and you know, kind of perform on an equal playing field. You know, I think this is very much pie in the sky thinking, um, whether this happens or not. Um, but it was interesting to hear that from um, a, represent, a representative of AQA, you know, AQA being one of the biggest, if not, you know, I think it is the biggest exam provider um, in Great Britain, um, in Wales, in, uh, in in Scotland, in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, should I say? So you know that was quite interesting to hear. Um, just you know, before we do finish off and and we close, you know, I spoke about some innovative technologies in you know the the practice sets that um, Google spoke about. Um, one thing, actually, that really did surprise me about today was esports. You know, I was not expecting to go to Bet 2023 and to see so much attention and money and emphasis placed on electronic sports. Um, You know, I spoke to, you know, I spoke to a few people today concerning this and it was just interesting to hear them talk about esports and, you know, how they are going to be huge in you know in in in, in decades uh, decades to come um you know it really did you know take me there were whole swathes and whole you know floor spaces dedicated to top spec machines and the uh, delivery as it were of esports inside of educational settings and at first i was like so this is basically gaming if any of you don't know i am an avid gamer i love video games i've been playing video games pretty much from when you know i was a a child in the you know you know the early 90s onwards you know i i love video games um you know uh, role-playing games in, in 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 particular um so to to me video gaming is a a hobby it's a pastime um it's something you interact with for for me anyway for fun and enjoyment um so to see gaming inside of this 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 uh, innovative show today and to hear you know 
think lead thinkers and and consultants uh, and educators talking about esports in schools, I was a bit thrown off. I was like, well, wh- why why do we want students playing video games inside of schools? But actually, it, the discussions that I was having, you know, a lot of them alluded to, well, why do we have games and sports inside of schools? And I was like, well, for physical. <laughs> exercise you know kids need to be healthy it's like okay that's great so they could they could be healthy we could just get them running on treadmills and etc etc but you know in schools especially in private in the private sector you have highly competitive um sports where students participate you know in that co-curricular and develop into the sporting industry a huge industry when we talk about sports you know think about rowing think about rugby think about football you know think about cricket you know think about the sports that schools champion and you know they they deliver to their students and the the point that really stuck to me in talking to one practitioner was um and and by the way when i talk about esports the the main sport that we were you know i was encountering was formula one racing um basically racing simulators and the setups that some of these people have we're talking free screens that are surrounding you so it's as if you're you're completely immersed in this video game experience sat in a pod that could only be described as the shell of a formula one racing car with pedals with steering wheel with like a headset on, on your head so you know there's a lot of investment that's been placed into these these e-sports this 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 racing f1 simulators and he explained to me that traditionally you would if you wanted to be an f1 driver you would have to invest thousands of pounds countless hours of time um, you'd have to have the right connections know the right people to be able to immerse yourself in that world and esports kind of strips away that privilege and it opens it up and can potentially open it up for anyone to participate in that sport so and actually there is already competitions out there that you know award hundreds of thousands of pounds um, dollars whatever it may be to actual com- competitors and it got me thinking actually because there was a there was a child that i taught um two years ago in fact no it's actually last year he finished his, his gcse he's a great student um he was autistic um you know he he for some reason he was placed into a bottom set class purely on the basis that he he was autistic but he was actually quite bright and i think he achieved uh, grade sixes and sevens for me in in, in the end um but he was comfortable in, in this particular set anyway because his friends were there but I remember him once talking to me about his interests and hobbies, and he spoke about um, r- driving F1 cars. And I was like, oh, it's just a computer game. And he got really irate and, and, and spoke to me at length about his passion for F1. And actually, it wasn't just a hobby. He actually competed. And I kind of humoured him and just kind of brushed that aside. But going to this, uh, you know, the, the Bet 2023 and seeing you know the time and effort that's placed on such a sport it really took me back and made me think of this child because he was actually talking to me about something quite serious to him and he was competing in a league that i thought was just you know a childish gimmick but actually he he probably was competing against professional e-sport racers and i think and the, the kind of rhetoric and the message that i got today and this is what i'm saying is the you know the surprise as it were of the show is that you know there's potential here for educators to incorporate this into their you know their 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 extended curriculum as it were outside of school kind of like you have those um sports clubs after school you know netball rugby whatever it may be i think there's an opportunity for education in the 21st century to begin growing e-sports stars um genuinely i think colleges schools that adopt this you know they they could be creating these rising stars of the e-sport network um 
you know, if anyone is familiar with um, a, the, the the Asian continent, like uh, Korea, uh, South Korea, um, China, uh, you know, esports are huge in Thailand as well. They are huge industries there. And I think that is now filtering across into the West, um, which is, yeah, fantastic. But that, that was the surprise of the show. Now, I want, you know, I, I am going to bring the show to an end today. Um, my, my closing thoughts are that Bet 2023 was a great experience. It shaped, it was shaping the future of ed- education, expressing, you know, all that is innovative. Now, I was really excited to attend. And for any of you listening, if you ever get a chance, do sign up and attend. You know, if ever the opportunity comes your way, go there, embrace the technology, you know, absorb the the, the innovative culture that's around for you. You know, it, it's an amazing experience. Now, if you have any you know questions on the topic, if you have anything that you want to contribute to the discussion, you know, reach out to Teachers Talk Radio, uh, reach out to me via LinkedIn. If you search for Mark Nichols, um, future leader, you will find me on there. Um, you know, chuck those questions to us and, and we'll explore. But, you know, other than that, I'll bring the show to a close today. Um, our next episode, we will explore the policy landscape of artificial intelligence, as well as look at some of the pressing um, issues on leaders in the in the 21st century. And by that, I mean the time that we have as educators uh, being stripped away from us um, through the underfunding of our current government. Anyway, with that, I wish you all a good evening. It's been a fantastic day today. Um, thank you for the opportunity, Tom, and thank you, Seema, for your hospitality. It was great to meet you in person. Okay, have a good evening, guys. See you later. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.